ungodly King Nebuchadnezzar and how God transformed his heart and made him a king after God's heart. So it was cool to see how um, he just expressed and declared how great God was. Um, so I'm just going to read you what he proclaimed of his great God that transformed him. In Daniel 4, 3, it says, It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders of the Most High God and what he's done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. So that's what we've come to do this morning, to a most high God, to declare his wondrous acts, his mighty deeds, his signs. Jesus, we are thankful, Lord, that you are faithful, God, to transform a king, a mighty, a mighty powerful man. God, to see your goodness. So this morning, we are not kings, but we are your people, Jesus. And we ask, God, that you would come into this place as we worship your name together. Show us signs and mighty wonders this morning. God, transform our hearts, Lord, from Gentile, ungodly people, full of sin, Jesus. We stand before you, God a pure heart, God, that we can stand before you and worship your name this morning, the most high God. Let our praise be a welcome for your spirit to dwell in this place. We love you, Jesus. Here 
Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name, Jesus. Jesus, you reign. so thankful that those words are true, that the Lord reigns above all. He is presiding over everything. This is not new to the Lord. This is holy against unholy, evil against good. This is a spiritual battle, no doubt, the times that we're in. And I, and I want to just uh, remind us of that. There are many, many things in our society and in our culture that want to divide us and separate us. Um, color is a very popular thing right now to, to separate people on um, beating a drum that one type of life or one set of lives are more important than another. And uh, Jason did just a beautiful job last week of reminding us that we are all created in the image of God, and therefore every life has the value that the Lord himself has placed on it. And to, to start with the premise that one is not as appreciated or valued as the other is biblically wrong, and it is evil. As the church, we are called to be a type of first fruits that we would look like Christ. So it is him that we have in common. It is not race. It is not culture. It is not economics. It is our savior because we are all the same. We are sinners in need of a savior. And because he has the authority to be the judge, he has the authority to save. So it is him that we worship. It is his name that we glorify. And it is by that name and the work of the cross that we are saved. So that is what we gather to, to celebrate in common. There is no room for division, cultural division, social division in the body of Christ. It is unbiblical. And that is the attack currently on the church. And make no mistake, this is not about color or, or social justice or anything else. This is about your soul you will either end up in heaven or in hell. You are bound for eternity. And the enemy hates your soul. This is always about whether you're saved or not. I listened to a story of a pastor telling a group of his peers, well-known men of God, preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was so passionate about what they were doing in the name of unity, bringing different religions together and he said this is not this is not about unity this is not about coming together as one Christian church this is about proclaiming the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ because ultimately it is about whether you are saved or not it's not how we do church or how they do church or how good our kids programs are or anything like that it is your soul there is a God who made you, who loves you enough that he killed his son for you. And it's just that you know him. And he wants nothing more than for you to know him. And if we're weeding our way through, through what color we are and, and what social justice issues we have to figure out within the church, we'll never get to the gospel of Christ. And that is the intention of the enemy. I don't know what the next few weeks or months or I don't know, however long, the mayor said indefinitely. If we have to meet with mass on next week, I say we should meet with mass on next week because the body should not forsake the gathering 
and we should come together and worship the living God because that's what we have in common. The Christian has our Savior in common. The living God, the God of the universe, has miraculously called you from death to life. This is what we have in common. And this is all we need to have in common. I want to read to us out of 2 Corinthians 5, 15, and 16, I think. It says, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the, to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. If we're constantly looking to our past, we can all get mad about something. But the reality is we were dead in our sins and trespasses. And in Christ, we are alive. And that is the future of the Christian, the believer. And we are believers gathering to worship our Savior. That is our focus and our life's purpose. That we are the image of Christ on this place that is destined for hell. Do I want revival? Absolutely. But it is one soul at a time. It is not masses coming together and bowing the knee. The world hates Christ. And they hate us because they hate him and that is evident and whatever restrictions they put on our meetings it is to deter the meeting so we need to just be aware that we share Christ in common and we come together whether we're wearing masks I heard a guy calling face diapers the other day which I thought was sort of funny uh, whatever they are, whatever we have to put on to come together we should do it because it's in Christ's name Pray for us, and then we'll have church. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you are so good, God. Jesus, thank you for your death and resurrection that we might be saved, that we could be friends of God, reconciled to our Creator. I pray, God, that by your word, you would remind us of the value of life that all are created in the image of Christ, that all are of one race, that we are the human race. And apart from you, we are dead and going to hell. Call us back to you, Lord. I pray, God, that we would just get over ourselves and come to you. your way in your church as you are faithful to do you are sovereign thank you that you are the living God you're worthy of all the glory and honor and praise I pray that this church would know you have your way in us this morning be glorified by the proclamation of your word this morning we love you Lord and we ask these things in Jesus name amen For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to also have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Church. 
appreciate Josh, uh, Pastor Josh Sharon from his heart. We missed him last Sunday, him and his wife and his family. They were enjoying so much needed time away together. They've come back more united and in love. And the last half of this year is going to be gangbusters, right? So don't miss it. We got some good leaders. Appreciate it. Um, if you were with us last week, um, or if you saw online, some of you were here. We had some people out. But uh, it was really a long introduction into this section of Scripture that we're, we're going to be in this morning in John chapter 5. And uh, so there, there is two parts to this message. Um, we, we, I was kind of setting the table to get into verses 25 through 29, talking about the resurrection. Uh, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. And I left you last week with this question in mind to keep in mind. And it was, how do I present the gospel with someone's eternity in mind? Uh, how, how do I keep that at the forefront? And again, Pastor Josh did a great job over the, uh, this time leading up to the break about really focusing in on uh, the eternal consequences that are at hand for uh, people in general. That there is a, res- a resurrection for the unbeliever and the believer. There is a bodily resurrection that will take place. And sometimes um, when we present the, the gospel, uh, we, we do a very good job, at least myself, uh, um, at, at keeping the immediate future in front of somebody. Um, be, because when someone comes to you, uh, a lot of times they're dealing with an issue. They're, they're wrestling with something. And it could be marital, it could be financial, it could be just whatever, right? And so as a Christian, we're always like Christ, Right? He may not fix it right away, but, but Christ, like that's where your hope is. Because as a Christian, we know the hope is eternal. And so we, we bring that eternal mindset into the immediate. And, and sometimes we just don't do a, a good enough job maybe up front presenting that gospel so that they are aware that we're speaking to their eternal consequences. And so when you present the gospel, are we keeping people's eternities in mind? Where they're going to spend eternity. This life, the Bible tells us, is a vapor. It is, it is a mist. Uh, what's going on tomorrow may not have any relevance 30 years from now or uh, when we're with Christ, you know, or when we're separated from Christ. And so we want to keep people's eternities in mind when we're sharing the gospel. And again, if we, if, if we do that justice, as I look in Scripture and I see the words of Christ to the unbelievers, to his followers. He's very direct in the point that he is trying to make. In fact, here in this section of Scripture, verse 25 to 29, he's not going to pull any punches or back down from from the confrontation. He's actually going to go to their eternity. He's going to go to the resurrection. And and it's kind of an odd uh, place to be in this part of Scripture when they're talking about uh, wanting to persecute and kill Christ for his miracles and his teaching and their and they're at odds with him, and then all of a sudden he stops for these first, uh, these these four verses, five verses, and said, "We're going let's talk about the resurrection." Uh, like Pastor Josh sa- said again, uh, he he has the authority to be your judge. He, he will be your judge. And so, um, when I look at the Word of God, I mentioned last week that even if somebody is offended with me because of the gospel, if they're offended with me. If, they are, if, if that leaves them up at night uh, wrestling with their eternity, then I'm okay with that offense. If that causes them to think, where are they going to be spending that? Where, where are they going to be, with Christ or apart from Christ? If it offends them, then I'm okay as long as they're wrestling with their eternity. If I'm a sinner, an unbeliever in Christ, many people have read this this book, they have heard the gospel, and they have been unmoved and unchanged. But if I don't know Jesus, and I read the words from Jesus, I should be terrified about my eternity. I should be terrified about it. And so often, I think we give people a pass to just let them, like it's, it's a, a choice, you know, white milk or chocolate milk, right? Chocolate milk. I like chocolate milk, you know? But a choice that has no consequences. It just doesn't have any consequences. It's just for the immediate. If it can't fix the situation, then it doesn't matter. It might fix itself on its own. Where will they spend eternity? 
And that's the question I left you last week. I'm not going to get into a second long-winded introduction, so we're going to move into John chapter 5, verse 25 through 29. If you do have your Bibles with you, you can turn there. We will have some uh, references on the screen for you. And we want to listen to the words of Christ about the resurrection, about the resurrection. So John chapter 5, verse 25 through 29, I'm reading from the ESV. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here. So we have an hour that is coming, but we have one that is now here upon us. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Again, the first verse, he is the Son of God, now he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So everyone is going to experience a bodily resurrection. They are going to be resurrected from the dead in physical form. It says all who are in the tombs, in the tombs everyone who has ever lived uh, is going to experience this resurrection, believer or unbeliever. Upon hearing his voice, they're going to come forth from the grave. And what he is saying is when they literally hear the voice of God, when they hear my voice, they are coming forth. So this is practical. This is literal. This is going to happen. It's not just for the believer in Christ. It's for the sinner as well. Everyone will experience this bodily resurrection. So just prior to this, in verse 15 through 17, which Pastor Josh covered, the, the, the Pharisees, they had been persecuting Jesus up to this point. They were persecuting him because of his miracles and his ministry. And um, specifically, he heals a man on the Sabbath. And it wasn't the healing that he was necessarily being persecuted for. It was because he healed on the Sabbath, the holy day, a day of rest. Uh, they were held to their tradition and their religion. And so they were angry that he performed a work on the Sabbath. They disregarded the healing altogether. But the next verse, in verse 18, they go from persecution, and then again, because of this healing that had, had occurred, they move into wanting to murder. So it's, it's, it, it, they're wanting to persecute him uh, and tear down his ministry, uh, say he's a worker of the devil, uh, and then very quickly they move to wanting to kill him, and it is because he claimed to be equal to God in every way. Not a twin, not a reflection, but he was saying, I am the fullness of God in bodily form. And they became offended at his gospel presentation, basically, because the gospel is about the ministry of Christ. They became offended at him to the point they wanted to kill him. And so how do we end up talking about the resurrection here in 25 through 29? They had been persecuting him. They were wanting to kill him. Jesus did not try to calm this storm that was raging in their hearts. He actually elevates his claim of deity, which angers them even more, by claiming this authority over the eternal. I'm going to be your judge. That he alone gives life. The Father has given him the authority to give life. And he alone will be their judge in all of eternity. We can separate this, uh, these verses, 25 to 29, in, in two ways. The, the, the first two verses, 25 and 26, are speak, speaking of a spiritual resurrection. He references and gives himself the title, Son of God. And that speaks to the spiritual new birth, the resurrection that only the believer will experience. Verse 25 and 26 is for the believer in Christ. They will experience this spiritual resurrection. The one who repents calls upon the name of the Lord. They are the ones that are born again. Verse 27 and 29 is also for the believer, but it is also for that Pharisee and the sinner, the one who does not repent, uh, it speaks of a bodily, a physical resurrection. So both the saved and the lost will come forth from the tomb experiencing a bodily resurrection. So to the spiritual, John 5, 25 through 26, the Lord says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Those who hear will live. Again, be thinking spiritual. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. He's speaking of the bodily resurrection um, that is, uh, I'm sorry, he is not speaking of the bodily res resurrection to come in the future. He does, though, say an hour is coming 
and is now here. So if, 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 what is coming, but what is now upon us? It's the salvation of the sinner. That resurrection that is now here is the spiritual resurrection of the believer. It's now here. It is now upon them. It is now in front of them in that it is the ministry of Jesus. It is the ministry, ministry of Christ to save. That's what Christ is concerned about. In, in John chapter 3, he speaks to Nicodemus. And where, where does he go? We talk about being born again, new life. Not being born of, uh, naturally. Uh, Nicodemus, you can't birth yourself again. You're already born. So Nicodemus is trying to make sense of what Christ is talking to him about. But he says, no, you must be born of wind and water. You must be spiritually reborn. And he's concerned about that, that afterlife with Nicodemus. In chapter 4, we spent um, many Many months, there's probably 12 videos, 15 videos on YouTube about the woman at the well. Woman at the well. And, and what does he speak to her about? It's not the water that she's concerned about. It's the, it's the drinking from this well and you will never thirst again. It's the spiritual application. Christ is moving in that spiritual realm upon people. And then here in verse five, or in chapter 5, we see this healing of the man. But again, it's not the physical healing that... It, it, Christ, um, he cares about it, but that's it, not the focus. And we make it the focus because it's such a powerful miracle. But this person never even had faith in Christ. He had faith in the healing waters of this pool. He didn't believe in Christ. And even when Christ heals him, he goes away and betrays him. And so it's not about the healing. What Christ was doing was the confrontation for what was going to affect these people's afterlives, their resurrection, their eternal. He was getting to this point. This is all spiritual. So it is a spiritual resurrection, the hour that is now here. Salvation is by and through his name alone. Spiritual birth that takes place within the heart. Again, which he spoke to Nicodemus, the woman at the well, and performs this healing in chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 2 summarizes this spiritual birth that takes place. Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it says this about us, that that transformation from the sinner to the believer. He says, and you were dead in the trespasses and, your, and sins. We are born into this. I think it was last week. I hope it's not my clothes today, but I think it was last week when I said one sin can condemn you. One sin can condemn you, but there isn't a multitude of good works that can save you. It, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You're born into it. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. This is who we are. And Paul is speaking to the believer in, this, in this, uh, these verses here. He says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved who? Us, the believer, He's speaking about the believer. And we talked about that love last week, that conditional and unconditional love. It's a different love for the believer than it is for all of mankind. Being God, re, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. I look at this verse and I see that healing at the man at the pool of Bethesda. Pastor Josh covered this uh, a couple weeks ago. He, he walks through the crowd of sick people. And he could have healed everybody. Christ could have walked through and healed everybody, but he chose one. He picked one of the crowd and said, I'm healing you. And you say, well, why would he just have chosen one person out of all of those sick people? And we just have to say that's the sovereignty of God. He chose one to heal. And the way I see this is when God being rich in mercy because of the great love of which he loved us. If you know Christ, he has chosen you. We were dead in our trespasses, but he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So you were dead spiritually in your belief. Jesus, Jesus moves among us, and he comes to give spiritual life to the spiritually dead for those that have ears to let them hear. His whole ministry, Christ's ministry, was about giving life to the sinner, spiritual life to the sinner. And so he's talking about spiritual resurrection here in these uh, first two verses, 25 and 26. It does say the hour is coming, though. And so we wrestle with that. Well, if he's upon us, then what's the hour that is coming? And we just have to understand, looking in the scriptures, that there are things that, that uh, in regard to spiritual life that have to be completed that have not yet occurred. 
And it is the cross, it is the resurrection, it is the ascension, it is, it is the day of Pentecost that comes upon the church when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the believers. That hour, which is still spiritual resurrection, is coming. It's here in front of you, it's always been occurring since the faith of Abraham, and it is also an hour that is coming. All those who hear will live. This hearing takes place within the heart, John 3, 3, it is being born again, when God regenerates the sinner and when God speaks to the heart, giving them life. He mentioned in verse 26, the spiritual life within the believer that comes from the Father. It has been given to the Son to give to whomever he chooses. He mentioned it because men cannot give themselves what they don't have. I don't possess life. Uh, so I can't give myself something that I do not have. Only uh, life comes from the Father through the Son, and I can receive it from him. We can't do it by good works, by doing good deeds. I talked about that last week. We can't do it by simply hearing the gospel or reading his word, because again, many people have heard and read and never been moved. They're still concerned with the immediate, what's going on today. They're not concerned about the eternity. And so they'll hear this gospel and they won't be moved. They will remain dead in their sins. It is only the son that can give spiritual life because the father has given that authority to the son. And so you can imagine the anger and the hatred that was overcoming the Pharisees when he's standing before them and they are wanting to kill him for claiming to be equal with God and then he raises the bar. He, he steps up the conversation. He doesn't back down and say, well, guys, listen, uh, I, I can heal on some other day or I, or I can, let's work this out. You know, I'm coming to save you. I, I look at that conversation with Nicodemus in chapter 3 when he's having that conversation with Nicodemus. And he tells Nicodemus exactly what he's thinking, that you have to be born again or you will not see the kingdom of heaven. And he leaves. He leaves Nicodemus in the darkness, wrestling with his eternity. Walks away. And then we know the story of Nicodemus, that he comes to a saving faith. But Jesus didn't care to make it known to him at that, that point. He just spoke the message and then let him wrestle with it. Jesus says, I give life to whomever I will. The Pharisees are there. They're mad at Christ. He is claiming to give them life. He is saying, I will be your judge. Everything that they have been trying to achieve for centuries, their tradition, their religion, their good works, their feasts, their festivals, everything they have been trying to achieve, Jesus comes to them and says, it's worthless. I give life. I will judge. In verse 27, we then move from this spiritual resurrection for the believer and we move to a physical resurrection. And it is for the believer and the unbeliever. All will come out of the tomb. So we go from spiritual resurrection to physical. Verse 27 says, And he has given him authority uh, to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. And, and something just to take note of is in those first two verses, he re refers to himself as the Son of God. Spiritual application. Now he's referring to himself as Son of Man, a title that he takes on uh, the most in Scripture in the New Testament. And that Son of Man, we're talking about now this physical bodily resurrection where some will be raised to judgment. So we have the Son of God and the Son of Man separating spiritual resurrection and physical resurrection. Uh, the Son of Man comes from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. Daniel had a vision. And um, this is attributed to Christ. It's prophetic in, in, in this uh, calling himself Son of Man and the reason why Christ takes this title on uh, most, uh, most of the time in Scripture when he refers to himself. It's Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, the Father, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall, not, which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. His followers that knew the scripture understood what Daniel was saying, that this is the son of man, Christ standing before us, the Messiah, followed him. But the Pharisees were blinded by their hatred. They wanted to kill and persecute Christ. So Jesus is the perfect judge because not only is he divine, but he knows of the human experience. He is without sin, but yet was tempted in every way. And I love this quote from the Logos commentary as I was studying. It puts it like this. It says this about the Son of Man, uh, Christ, and, and, and his authority to judge us, to, 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 to judge us. 
It says, the appointment of a judge in our own nature is one of the most beautiful arrangements of divine wisdom in redemption. We're not standing before a being or, or, or some creator that has no relationship capabilities with us, that we're being uh, tested and judged against something that we can't live up to, a standard that we can't live up to. His, his divinity came in bodily form, and he is in our own nature, and it's one of the most beautiful arrangements of, of divine wisdom in redemption, that we will stand before a judge that knows exactly what we are going through on this life. He was sinless and perfect. We are made perfect through Christ, through the work of Christ. Spiritual resurrection was and is, it's, it was going on all the time, had been going on. It is the ministry of Christ. Physical resurrection, you know, physical, physical resurrection is yet to come, though. It is in the future tense. Verse 28 uses this hour is coming as well. Again, in 25 and 26, uh, it was the hour that is coming but is yet upon us for spiritual application. But verse 28, he says, don't marvel at this. Don't be, um, don't, 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 uh, be astounded by what I'm going to say to you. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. This is literal. This is the physical application. That everyone who has ever lived, including you who I'm speaking to, the, to the Pharisees, Jesus says, will, will be raised from the dead. There is an exception to the resurrection of everybody. And it, it's, it's two uh, individuals living in this church age uh, when Christ returns that will be caught up with him in the air. We refer to it uh, as a rapture. The scripture does not, but that's the term we use to define it. But it is this, it is this uh, coming together with Christ when he returns. And, and that's honestly where we all hope to be. Um, we, we don't want to experience death. And, and part of it, I think, one is you kind of, uh, well, we have some kids here, so I won't get too, um, too weird, I guess. Uh, I don't want to scare anybody, but. I mean, I think about it a lot of times, actually. I do. I think about death a lot of times. And I, I just mentioned last week, uh, like you saw in the bumper video, those grave markers, you know, being on the base at Fort Leavenworth and seeing that sea of white uh, grave markers, um, just being aware of my mortality, that uh, so thankful for the sacrifice that they made for our country, but at the same time, just knowing that that's a stop along the way, you know, and how, how that's all going to shake out. But, but I was going to, I will say this. The reason I think about it so often is because it's, it's the separation from the relationships you have here. And again, I don't know if, if Christ is big enough when, when we think that way. Because what we're saying is like, well, this relationship is a little better. Like, how's my wife going to get by? Or we, we've had the conversation like, I want to go first. She's like, no, I can't handle it. I'm like, no, I literally can't handle it. Like, I, I, I it's not, it can't take, take it. You know, I have to go first. And, you know, that's why I'm going through the drive-thru. I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'm eating... You know, I'm not, 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 you be healthy, I won't be healthy, but, but, but it's that separation, and then when we, when we get there, I, I gotta say, God, forgive me, because, because that leads to you, you know, and, and, and when I think of heaven, I, we, we are always about the immediate, like, well, I'm, I'm gonna see this person, or that person, or my grandma, or this kid, or, or whoever, and, and, and it's like, we put Christ here, and everything else here, and, and I want Christ to be in the center, like, Christ, I want to be where you are. And I want people to know that feeling. And so let's, everybody come along for the ride behind me. Like, I'll go first, you come behind me, and we'll all be with Christ. But I want to be with Christ and then everything else. You know, again, it's, it's always that we talk about spiritual gifts and we thank God for them. But, but do not pursue the gift over the giver. Don't, don't pursue the, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life and set aside Christ. They're all one and the same. And our pursuit and our focus, our worship is to Jesus. You are saved through Christ alone. And so um, I, I, we got off on that. Oh, yeah, the rapture. So, so it, we call it the rapture, but it is a ca- catching up with the church. And we all long to go that way. The, the apostles, they were longing. They, they thought it was upon them. They, the ones that were living, they were going to be the ones that were going to be raptured. And so we're 2,000 years removed from that. And we should still be, though, expecting that return just as they were. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17 says this, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven 
with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. A body will be united with spirit, uh, with the spirit for an eternal dwelling. Paul does build upon this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you want to read about this body resurrection, you can uh, turn, turn to there at some time and, and read about the, the bodily resurrection being united with the spirit. But our eternal dwelling will either be with God or apart from God. That's the only two choices. We talk about the narrow road and the wide road. You're either with God or you are apart from God. A spiritual uh, and physical resurrection for the believer, uh, but just a physical resurrection for the unbeliever. Finally, we come to verse 29. Jesus says something that we want to take just a moment to work through. And again, it is a reason, I think, here. We, we want to be careful as Christians um, to not isolate Scripture, to, to not pull it out of context. Just always keep in mind that there's a verse prior, a verse after, there's a chapter, you know, we have them uh, delineated that way. But, but if we pull this verse by itself, it, it could be a faith plus works type of salvation. And so there, the, some of those things we just want to rest through. What is Christ saying? He says in verse 29, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And we say, well, wait, isn't salvation by faith alone? This, is, this would say, well, is it, is it faith plus works? Those who have done good, they receive life. Those who have done evil receive judgment. Again, like I mentioned last week, there are a lot of people out there that are good people, good, kind-hearted people, and they want nothing to do with Christ. They want nothing to do with Christ, and they will die in their sins. And so when we look at a verse like this, we say, well, what is Christ saying? Because we have seen up until now, through John chapter 1, through up until this point, that belief is by faith alone. It's so simple to hear this message and to say, I believe that. Faith is by believing alone, that faith alone saves, John three sixteen. Works, therefore, uh, or good deeds, they are a byproduct of the heart. They are an evidence of someone's salvation, that the fruit. They, they don't produce salvation, but they can reveal the presence or the absence of salvation. We see uh, throughout the Old Testament that it was always faith that saved, not faith plus anything else. Romans chapter 4, verse 2 through 4 says this about speaking about um, Abraham. It says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, a belief in God. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. If you believe that good works are all that's required uh, to, to, to get you to heaven, to be with God, then that is, that is your payment. Those good works are your payment in this life. So it is believing, obedient faith that saves. So why compare deeds then? Good deeds versus evil deeds. According to Luke chapter 6, verse 43 through 45, it is the only thing that you can compare. You, you, it says you will know them by their fruit, what the heart produces. Christ couldn't compare the faith of a, of a believer and an unbeliever because an unbeliever, is, they don't have any faith. There's, no, there's not faith in anything. The, the man who was healed at the pool of Bethesda, he went away lacking faith. He was healed, received the gift, the miracle, but leaves Christ with no faith and betrays him. You can't compare the spiritual life of a believer with the spiritual life of an unbeliever because the sinner is spiritually dead. They have no life spiritually. They are bankrupt. And so the only thing you can compare is what Christ does is the fruit or their deeds. The believer, they have faith in life. The unbeliever does not possess those things, but both of us, sinner and saved, we have behaviors, actions, deeds, and so it is those works that are produced from the heart that in the end validates or denies your salvation. James 2, 26 says, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, which is what the resurrection of the unbeliever will face, so also faith apart from works is dead. It is faith that saves. Works is the fruit. Saving faith is proven by their good deeds. Faith without works is dead. When we speak of good works, again, we want to be careful of what we are conveying to the unbeliever. We know that kindest, most generous person that is good 
trying to serve others, but they want nothing to do with religion, Christianity, or most importantly, Christ himself. And if that's the case, then how do you tell someone your good works, your good deeds won't save you? Speaking to the Pharisees, everything you have done for centuries, it amounts to nothing. I alone give life, and I alone judge. The Bible reveals to us that God demands perfection. He is a holy and perfect God, and he demands perfection. That is his standard, perfect and holy, as he is perfect and holy. But it also says that we fall short, Romans 3, 23. All of us fall short of that perfection. I came across a quote a couple weeks ago in preparing. I think it was on Legionnaire website, but it didn't have an author attributed to it. It was just in talking about good deeds and works. And it says, the, it is the only the good works of Christ, it is the work of Christ imputed to us through faith alone that will save us. Christ has the works. We believe in that and we are saved. Again, prophetic, it is my close. One sin is enough to condemn you. But a multitude of good works will never save you. It is only the good works of Christ imputed to us through faith alone that will save us. Amen. If the worship team wants to make their way back. No amount of good works will save us. You might think, well, why didn't Christ just soften it a little bit, the message? I think in all those cases with Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the healing of Bethesda, and now in this confrontation with the Pharisees, he was okay with them being offended at him. Uh, he came to die, and so he knew that if they were going to persecute him, wanting to murder him, that he was okay as long as the gospel message was proclaimed. And we see the woman at the well receiving it, and a lot of the people that lived in the town receiving it. We see Nicodemus coming to faith in Christ. It's okay to stand up for what you believe in the gospel, to present it in a loving manner with somebody's eternity in mind. If you care about them, then care about where they will spend that because tomorrow isn't as much of a concern. The resurrection of the believer, it is an act of grace and it is an act of mercy. And we who are found to be in Christ will be raised to eternal life. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The sinner, on the other hand, they will have a physical resurrection, but they will be raised from death unto spiritual death. Theirs is a resurrection of divine justice, an act of grace and mercy upon the believer, and an act of divine justice upon the sinner. Matthew 25, 46 says, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So I asked last week as well, as I'll ask this week, which resurrection are you headed for? That, that narrow road that we're asking God to, Lord, just please keep us on that. Help us not to get off on this wide path. Everyone who has ever lived will experience a physical resurrection. That hour, Christ says, is coming. The believer that has been born again to eternal life the sinner to face sentencing and eternal damnation. So if you want to pass out of death to life, you need to hear the word about Christ and simply believe in his name. Faith in, in God, faith in Christ, it, it, it's again, I, I look to that healing at the pool of Bethesda. It, it's God's sovereignty to, to choose, to, to open your heart to receive that gospel. He chose that man and healed him, and that man didn't have to have any faith or regardless, but it was God's prerogative. He sovereignly chose. And so faith is a gift of God given to us by him. Christ alone saves, makes himself known to his adopted sons and daughters. But the wonderful mystery about salvation is that it does not happen apart from the sinner hearing at the heart level, repenting and following Jesus. It's a perfect marriage of God's sovereignty to save and our response to being saved. That gift of salvation and our acceptance of that gift. So if you want resurrected life with Christ because of you are unsure of where you're going to spend eternity, then the Bible just says call upon his name. Call upon the name of Jesus. All who call upon that name, call upon the name of the Lord, 
they will be saved. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together, Lord. You are so good to us and so gracious. God, I pray that um, your message does not fall upon deaf ears. Wherever we're at, Father, this morning, tomorrow, this week, as we proclaim this message, that it does not fall upon deaf ears. Because it is the eternity that matters, God. That we would be messengers of your gospel, faithful and true, not worried about offense, Lord, proclaiming in a, in, a, in a way that loves people, cares for people, and about the longevity, Lord, of the decisions that they make in regard to your message, Father. Let that weigh upon us, Jesus, always keeping our destiny in front of us, because you have kept mine and ours in front of you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Stand with me, please. As we close worship, and we hope to see you back Sunday, next Sunday at 930.
time. We'll sing Chronicles. Sing Chronicles, come home. The helpless find hope. Say love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison doors swing wide. The dead come to life. The love is on the move. The miracles take place, the cynical find faith, love is breaking through when the Father's in the room, Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking, love is breaking through when the Father's in the room, I said love is breaking through when the Father's in the room, Thank you guys so much for coming this morning. We'd like to invite you next week at 9.30. Have a great week. We will see you next Sunday.